Welcome back to The Real News. I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore. August 6th marks the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act. And to consider its impact and current value among younger activists, we've decided to convene a small panel here at The Real News. We have Mr. Davon Love, Director of Public Policy for the Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. We have student activist Michaela Gilliam Price and Dewan Patterson, a student of public policy, a community activist focused on civil engagement, mental health, and education. Welcome all of you to The Real News. Thanks, Thank man. you. So, Mikhail, let's start with you. We, we, again, have seen the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act passed, uh, 50 years of civic engagement at new levels for, for African America. How do you feel its value is, is measured in today's climate as a young activist, um, the power of the vote, the use of the vote, the focus of, on, on, on the vote as a method of uh, mechanism of change? What, what would you, how do you respond to that? What do you think about that? Um, well, as a high school student activist, I represent a large constituency which cannot yet vote. Mm -hmm. um, so voting is a sort of abstract thing for us. It's something that we're working towards, but not something that we can actively engage in. As Are you excited to get to that point? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'll be voting next year for my first time. Um, but I think that coming from this standpoint, we have an important um, perspective because we know that we cannot essentialize our political agency to just being voting, right? So we're forced to look to different alternatives instead of just voting to activate that same political agency. So while it might not hold the same significance for our age group, it's something that we look to, we look forward to engaging in um, in the future. But um, as of right now, it's, uh, it's really just like a stasis point for how we can work around it. Dave, same question. I mean, and even as Michaela talks about the excitement of being able to vote for the first time next year, you know, part of my concern at least is for whom will she be able to vote and what, what value will it bring? What do you think? Well, in reflecting on, you know, the fight to get the Voting Rights Act of 1965 passed, I think about the fact that what's, what spawned, what, what inspired it was the importance of black political power. And I think sometimes the vote is reduced to just this abstract ethical obligation to participate in the political process instead of using the vote strategically to build power in the fissures that exist in the larger political structure. And so I think given that, you know, particularly here in Baltimore, um, we have local elections coming up. Um, which have a dramatically more um, direct impact on lives of, of people um, in, in Baltimore. Um, for me, the vote is one of many tools that one should use in order to develop the kind of political power necessary um, to organize our communities effectively. I mean, you ran not too long ago for local office. How did you situate that campaign, given your broader political uh, perspective on things? How did you, yeah, how did you engage that? Um, I mean, well, our, our general idea was around um, kind of representing a view that it's important to shift the dynamics of power in society and kind of saw the campaign as just giving an alternative, like you said, to those who traditionally had to vote for the lesser of a few evils. Um, and one of the things I was able to learn from that is that there's a tremendous amount of money, resources, and institutions behind making sure certain candidates are made more available to the public than others. And so a part of our work since the campaign has really been around cultivating a culture around civic and political engagement that can help to break up some of the institutional monopoly over what candidates are made available in the mainstream to, to the general public. Juan, what do you think about all this? Well, Devon said a lot of things that I would um, agree with. And I think the Voting Right Act is important right now because we have to look at things from a grassroots level. Uh, too often times that we get caught up in the federal and the national level and we forget about the lower level within the localized level. That level is one of the most, if not the important level that we can participate in as far as the political arena. That's the era where, that's the arena where we begin to see more immediate results. So we begin to get people more engaged in that arena first because within a certain community that's impacted by the Voters' Rights Act, they perceive that the only time they should be politically engaged is during the federal elections and the, the, the presidential candidates and these things and these discussions. However, if we begin to start looking at the, the local level, we can have more immediate impact and influence. And if we look at Baltimore City, we have a 64% African-American um, 
population. But however, when we look at the distribution of wealth, it does not reflect that. So voting rights and the voting rights and political engagement, it transpires over into the economical distribution of wealth as well. Well, I mean, but that even goes back to the thing, I, I'm, the quote I mentioned to all of you off air, you know, my, one of my favorite qu quotes on this issue from George Jackson, what, what good is the vote after the fact of monopoly capital? If the idea among some is that we can use the vote to more equitably distribute wealth, how does that, or doesn't that stand in contradiction to the way voting is often dependent, dependent upon, or, the, or who we have to vote for is dependent upon how much money they have and can use to promote themselves. In other words, the wealth that we're looking to redistribute works against us in terms of developing campaigns and candidates and even parties that would be of any value uh, to the rest of us. Uh, I hope any of that made sense, and I'd love to hear your response uh, I mean, to that I, point. I think, yeah. I think when we look at the things made available to us, because I think it's important that we think about um, building e economic infrastructure in our communities as a way, as a basis for launching different political and social endeavors. And I, th and I see moments of strategic engagement in the political process as a part of a, a potential strategy in terms of seizing some of the wealth and creating the kind of infrastructure we need in order to advance our interests. And so I think sometimes that gets confused with an interest in participating in the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's important that we use the strategic things we have at our disposal. So if you think about like local you know, city government, talking about access to contracts, you know, access to monies and resources to do certain programs that will help to create a culture around revolutionary political thinking and so forth. So I think it's important for us when we think about the, the, the vote in the context of the quote you just mentioned, that we see them as strategic ways to take advantage of the fissures in the system right. as opposed to wanting to participate in the system as it exists. Anybody else want to respond to that? And, um, I would like to bring up a, a good point. If we look at current Baltimore City State's Attorney Mosby, she was outspent. She, uh, she was outspent and out-earned as far as raising financial capital. However, the approach that she took was a grassroots approach and focused on the social capital that Baltimore had to offer. See, if we begin to begin to galvanize the community and think of the importance of social capital, because we have the numbers here. If you have the numbers and you begin to pick that interest and you're going against some of the corporate interests that have the, the economical support to push certain institutions and, and figures inside a place. But if you go ahead and talk on the social capital, you have more boots on the ground, they have more time. See, that's the thing that with the economical piece of the political process, they have that money to push somebody in front of you because, because they're giving them more money and more time. But if you got some people here, like in Baltimore, you got a lot of people disengaged, unemployed, uneducated, but they still have interests in their bodies, in the social economy. Yeah, but I mean, even that, the point you raised kind of speaks to one of my concerns because Ms. Mosby um, is not a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, she may have been able to pose herself progressively in, in, in the Freddie Gray in, in incident, but even right now, she's turned right back to a regular state's attorney and starting to prosecute mostly black, poor people who are going to, to spend a lot of time in jail. So uh, uh, your point is well taken, but I, I don't want to, to, to confuse her with, with a true radical break from, from you know, uh, what's been going on. Uh, Michaela, do you want to add to yeah, that? Or, absolutely. Or? So I think that the capital that's used to, like, what you were saying earlier, like, push certain candidates in front of you and push certain parties in front of you, um, I think that's extremely problematic because it instills a sort of, like, complacency in black community, mm -hmm. uh, communities especially. Um, just, like, looking at the dichotomy between, like, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in Maryland um, especially, um, I think a lot of people find comfort in being Democratic, uh, Democrats, right? Um, it seems comfortable. It seems like the most progressive option. Um, but instead, we should be shifting to uh, a model that Davon's talking about where we're redirecting that capital and creating independently black-owned institutions to advocate for our own personal needs and our own personal interests, and we don't currently have that. Is there any discussion in your circles of the uh, Ujima People's Party? And, and what can you, th this is the independent black party here in Maryland uh, that is looking to, to do or address some of the concerns you all. How, what are folks in your space is saying about that? Is that, is it inspiring? Is it? You, you like, I'm not sure if that's worth our time. Should we stay with the Democratic Party? But, well, most people, I think, see it as a pipe dream. You know, yeah. I think it's a... Uh... But isn't voting for Democrats? <laughs> <laughs> like, only... Anyway, I, I'm sorry about that. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But I think um, it's a good long-term project. 
in terms of what the end game should be. Because I think too many times we create objectives around limited possibilities. And so I think creating objectives around an end game that seems outside of the current political imagination, I think it's important to start to plant the seeds so that eventually, especially in a state like Maryland where a third of its population is African descended people, um, then you have a large sizable, you know, Latino, Latina population. So just thinking about the end game in terms of the acquisition of power to actually influence, um, you know, state legislation, the government in general, to, to me, seems like an end game that is more worthwhile than some of the short-term benefits that one may think that we get right, right. from do, going democratic. Any quick concluding comments from either of you? I yeah. would say, speaking back onto something you said earlier, not taking away from Mosby, but I was speaking on the social capital piece, no, the approach, right. the approach, and when we're talking about something he, we, he was talking about just just a few minutes ago, we have to go in this way of civically engaging them, but it comes on awareness. If we go ahead and go to the alternative um, parties outside of the two-party system that we've been accustomed to, a lot of times we're now culture in the community is oral history and tradition that they've been exposed to. And that conditioning proposed them and propelled them to go ahead and go into a particular arena of where it's a two-party system. So if we begin to deviate away from that, we have to begin educating more on the reasons why we need to go to an alternative. And that that alternative, we've taken our social capital somewhere else, then that will make the other parties more progressive to our interests. Okay. Um, so just like on the portion about the Ujima party, um, I think for in order for black institutions and black political parties for, like those to work, um, we have to be mindful of two things. One, that it's not a short narrative, right? It's a long-term uh, goal, like what Dave Allen was saying, but also we have to be mindful of black political leaders who, necess who don't necessarily have the best interests of the community at heart. Um, and just like pop up politicians who aren't really looking for the long-term goal, maybe just to name, um, they play a large part in delegitimizing black institutions like the Ujima party and like leaders of a beautiful struggle, right? Because people don't know what's to be seen as genuine, right? So we have to be extremely mindful of that in order for black institutions to be sex successful. Kayla, Davon, Dewan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here at The Real News. For all involved, I'm Jared Ball. And as always, as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody, and we'll catch you in the whirlwind. <laughs>